So tonight, I'm pleased to welcome Catherine Schules. She joins us to speak on her new book, Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margin of Error. Publishers Weekly writes that Schules cast a fresh and irreverent eye upon the profound meanings behind our most ordinary behaviors. In this instance, how we make mistakes, how we behave when we find we have been wrong, and how our errors change us. It is ultimately wrongness, not rightness, that can teach us who we are, she asserts. Schules writes with such lucidity and wit that her philosophical inquiry becomes a page turner. Being wrong encompasses the cataclysmic and the commonplace. Being wrong may lead to fun or futility. Being wrong can be transformative, and Schulz writes, I encourage us to see error as a gift in itself, a rich and irreplaceable source of humor, art, illumination, individuality, and change, a nap description of her engrossing study. And finally, from the Associated Press, please take this advice, read Being Wrong because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> Catherine Schulz has written for The Nation, Rolling Stone, The Huffington Post, and The New York Times Magazine, among other publications. A former editor and of the online environmental magazine Grist and The Santiago Times in Chile, she was awarded a Pew Fellowship in International Journalism in 2004. We are thrilled to have her with us tonight, so will you please join me in welcoming Catherine Schulz. Uh, you just heard snippets from the Publishers Weekly review of this book, which if any of you are authors, you know the very first thing that happens for your book in terms of reviewing is Publishers Weekly, which is this trade magazine, comes up with a review of your book. And uh, until then, it's kind of silence from the outside world about this thing you've been killing yourself to write. So a couple months before the uh, Publishers Weekly book, Publishers Weekly review came out, and many months before the actual book came out, I had this dream that I'm going to embarrassingly disclose to all of you. And uh, in the dream, I was reading a review of my book online. And it was the most scathing, horrible pan of a review you could ever possibly imagine. It was like the kind of review that really only the psyche of a writer could possibly generate. <laughs> and the first line of this review, and I swear to you this is true, I woke up and I immediately wrote it down. The first line of the review was, in Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margin of Error, Catherine Schultz has managed to unite a difficult and whiny tone <laughs> with a subject matter everybody despises. <laughs> and I can feel the bookstore owner in the back saying, we are here to sell books, what are you doing up there? <laughs> But there's a reason I'm, I'm bearing my kind of crazed writer soul to you. Um, forget about the difficult and whiny tone. You guys can be the judge of that. But I do want to talk before I read from this book about its um, despicable subject matter. Ever since I decided that I wanted to write a book about being wrong, I would tell people the idea, and really everyone, whether it was like an editor, a publisher, random guy next to me on the train would, I'm sorry, I'm distracted by a friend from far away who just showed up. <laughs> anyway, I would tell people the idea of this book and they would say, oh, it's like one of those big idea books. Or more often they would just say, oh, it's like a Malcolm Gladwell book. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a certain amount of truth to that. This is certainly a book about an idea. Um, but I also think that this book belongs to another and uh, considerably more obscure, although possibly more interesting, literary genre. And uh, here's where my dream comes in, because that's the genre of books about things that everybody hates. <laughs> Surprisingly, there are a lot of these books. It is a long and storied genre. Um, Plato did not get involved in this category of books. <laughs> but he had this kind of less well-known older brother, which I think must have been a terrible fate. <laughs> but he, he had this brother, Glaucon, and Glaucon wrote a book about injustice, which would not be that abnormal. There's probably lots of books in this store about injustice, except that Glaucon decided to write a book in praise of injustice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he kind of... Uh, really created an entire category of books that other people then went on to replicate in various ways. Most famously, uh, Erasmus, the, the Renaissance scholar, uh, wrote a book, The Praise of Folly. And this tradition of writing books about 
widely hated subject matter has continued to our own day. So for instance, um, there's this, I meant to grab this book, but I forgot. There's this guy named uh, Robert Sullivan who wrote a book called uh, Rats. <laughs> it's a book about rats. <laughs> it is, as far as I know, the best-selling book about rats ever written. <laughs> and uh, another guy, Tom Vanderbilt, who was nice enough to say some nice things on the back of my book, wrote a best-selling, also a best-selling book about traffic, which I personally think is far more odious than rats and wrongness and folly and, and really like probably as bad as injustice. <laughs> so there's all these books about hated things and the question is why. And in all of these examples and many more, the people behind these books set out to examine and at least to some extent refurbish the reputation of a subject matter that most of us instinctively draw away from and dislike. And my book was very much written in this spirit. I got interested in understanding how we as a culture think about being wrong, how we feel when we get things wrong, why we feel the way we do, what the costs of that attitude toward error might be, and hopefully by the time you reach the end of the book, challenging and maybe to some extent changing that relationship to being wrong. And in extraordinarily condensed form, I'm hoping to take you guys through that same trajectory tonight in like 18 minutes. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> so I thought I would start by reading a section of the book that I think captures our baseline feeling about being wrong, which as you will have gathered is not very positive. Um, so this first story that I'm gonna tell you is about a colleague of mine, and he's a man named Ross Gelbspan, and I better start out by asking, Ross Gelbspan, are you here? <laughs> <laughs> because Ross Gelspan is in fact a Bostonian, and although he had another commitment, was going to try to make it tonight, but it sounds like he was not able to. So we'll hear about him instead of hearing from him. I know Ross because, as you've heard in the introduction, I used to work for... That's better. <laughs> I used to work for an environmental magazine called Grist, and in that capacity I would occasionally edit Ross, which was something of a farce because he was a vastly more experienced journalist than I was. He had been covering environmental issues for... Uh, four decades or something. But anyway, we got to know each other at Grist. And this is a story about him. Back in 1972, when Ross was working for the Village Voice, he covered a press conference about the limits to growth, a study of the impact of economic development and population pressures on natural resources. The limits to growth made headlines all over the world when it was published, and it is still the best-selling environmental book of all time. It was really interesting, really frightening stuff, Ross told me. The press conference was about how all these various factors, increasing pollution, increasing population, diminishing resources, were going to hit a point of exponential takeoff. One of the speakers at the conference was Donella Meadows, a co-author of the book and a pioneering environmental scientist. Sitting in the audience during her presentation, Ross was struck by the contrast between the grim predictions she was describing and the fact that she was pregnant, that, as he put it, she had somehow found personal hopefulness in the midst of this really massive gloom and doom. He saw it as a small grace note, a reminder about the possibility of optimism and renewal in even the hardest of times, and he used it as the kicker to his story. The Voice printed the article on the front page. That would have been nice for us, except that Danella Meadows was not pregnant. I read this passage because I like to hear a room full of people and make that noise at the same time. <laughs> Certain mistakes can actually kill us. But many, many more of them just make us want to die. <laughs> That's why the word mortify comes up so often when people talk about their errors. Here is Ross verbatim. I was mortified. <laughs> I mean mortified, mortified. I was not a rookie. I'd been a reporter since 1961. I'd worked for the Philadelphia Bulletin. I'd worked for the Washington Post. But I'd never made an error like that, and I cannot begin to describe the embarrassment. The truth is, I'm still mortified when I talk about it. <laughs> Nearly 40 years have elapsed since Ross's article was published. 
the world has, in varying degrees, ignored, learned from, and defied the predictions in the limits to growth. Donella Meadows died in 2001. Even journalism as we know it is on its way out. Ross's embarrassment has outlived it all. <laughs> when I told him the expected publication date of this book, he said, good, with luck I'll be dead by then. <laughs> so, I want to first just tell you guys an anecdote that didn't make it into the book. I stopped working at Grist in order to start writing this book. And at some point early on in the process, I sent out a massive email saying, I'm working on such and such a topic. I'm looking for stories about being wrong. If you have any, get in touch with me. I hadn't talked to Ross in a couple of years. And he got this email. And by chance, he got it through a chain of connections that had nothing to do with Grist at all. So I get this email one day. It's from Ross. It has his story in brief. If you're interested and want more details, give me a call. I write him back right away. Ross, so great to hear from you. Love the story. Of course I want the details. I'll give you a call. Instantaneously, I get an email back. And it says, oh my god. <laughs> I didn't put two and two together. If I had known you were that Catherine Schultz, I would never have told you that story. <laughs> Which is to say that we find being wrong so embarrassing that when we have already going for us a pleasant professional relationship, we generally do not divulge such things. So one of the things I find interesting about Ross's story is that in the scheme of mistakes, it's not a terribly important one. I mean, it's terribly embarrassing. I'm really glad I wasn't the one who got the phone call when Danella Meadows <laughs> rang up the next morning. But, you know, as it turns out, she was gracious about it. Didn't really have any major impact on Ross's career, to put it mildly. He went on to write some spectacular books and did very well for himself. And yet, even in situations like that where the stakes are quite low, we do often have this reaction to being wrong, like we want to die. We say things, when we describe that moment of realizing a mistake we've made, we say things like, I wanted to drop through a hole in the ground. I wanted to disappear. I wanted to crawl into a cave. It's like there's so something so awful about being wrong that it would actually be preferable to just like cease to exist, to vanish from the face of the earth. And we have this other kind of strange way that we talk about wrongness too, and I'll just read briefly again from the book. Consider the oddly culinary vocabulary we use to talk about being wrong. In the aftermath of our mistakes, we eat crow, we eat humble pie, we eat our hat, and at the other end of that sartorial menu, we eat our shoe. And of course, we eat our words. These sayings differ in their origins, but the overall implication is clear. Error is both extremely unappetizing and very tough to digest. If being right is succulent, being wrong runs a narrow, unhappy gamut from nauseating to worse than death. This is the received wisdom about error that it is dangerous, humiliating, distasteful, and all told, unfun in the extreme. Now you will have figured out already that this is the attitude toward error that I am writing against in this book. And I wanna be very clear about the fact that that's not because I think that all mistakes are either benign or somehow wonderful, glorious things. There's no question that a lot of our errors can be tremendously costly, whether psychologically, materially, or we're still in terms of our health, our livelihood, or our lives. We don't have to look very far, <coughs> like the Gulf of Mexico, <laughs> to see that that's the case. But even in situations where the stakes of our mistakes are extremely high, I think we're very poorly served by this attitude I've been describing. We're poorly served by recourse to denial and blame and just wishing that whole matter of human fallibility would disappear. So I want to move on to tell you guys another story that is uh, kind of a higher stakes situation, although not a terribly grave one on account of the fact that I think that tragedy does not make for a good mood for a book reading. Uh, if our theme tonight is wrongness, we have kind of a secondary theme, and the secondary theme happens to be men named Ross. I can't explain it, it just happened that way. <laughs> this Ross is named John Ross. And uh, he's a real guy, or he was a real guy. 
but he seems like someone out of a storybook because when he was nine years old, he ran away and joined the Navy. <laughs> uh, and he worked his way up through the ranks of the Navy and he eventually became a commander. And in 1818, which is the year our story picks up, he was appointed by John Barrow, who was the subsecretary of the British Navy at the time, to <coughs> captain an extremely important expedition. This was an expedition to the Canadian Arctic to try to find the Northwest Passage. Now, if there's hi history buffs in the room, you guys all know that the Northwest Passage was this highly sought after water route, either through or around North America. Why was it sought after? It was sought after because this is the 19th century and we don't have airplanes, we don't have trains. How do we move our commercial goods around? We put them on boats. So if you have a waterway to move your commercial goods, you can get them from Europe to Asia much more rapidly, fuel a surge in global trade and make a whole lot of money. As a result for, I don't know, 300 years by now, there's been this massive global obsession to find the Northwest Passage. And in fact, at the point that John Ross sets sail, the British government had a standing offer of 20,000 pounds, which is $20 million in today's money to anyone who could find the Northwest Passage. So this is a reasonably high stakes situation. John Ross sets out from England with two ships, with 60 men and 30 years of naval experience. And he goes looking for the Northwest Passage. And after many months at sea, he and his crew arrive in Baffin Bay, which is where he's decided or actually been ordered to go find this thing. In specific, he's investigating these three sounds that are reputed to exist based on maps made by this guy named William, Bar uh, no, William Baffin, that's who the bay is named for, who 200 years earlier had gone to this region, made these kind of sketchy maps, nobody really believed them or knew if they were true. John Ross shows up and he's gonna try to verify the maps and find the Northwest Passage. And he goes to explore three of these sounds, which in classic British fashion are named Smith, Jones, and Lancaster. <laughs> so he checks out Smith, nothing there, you can't get out, it's not the entryway to the Northwest Passage, he gives up. Checks out Jones, same thing, no luck. And then he sails over to Lancaster Sound, which he has secretly thought all along was the most promising of the three, so he's pretty excited to get there. But they get to Lancaster Sound and it is just totally socked in with fog. There's not much they can do. They hunker down in their ships and they wait. And they wait, and they wait, and finally, on the afternoon of August 31st, 1818, an officer comes and knocks on Captain John Ross's door. Says, the skies are clearing. John Ross goes up to the deck, and here's what he wrote in his journal. I distinctly saw the land round the bottom of the bay, forming a chain of mountains connected with those which extended along the north and south side. This land appeared to be at a distance of eight leagues, which is about 25 miles. And Mr. Lewis, the master, and James Haig, the leading man, being sent for, they took its bearings, which were inserted in the log. The mountains, which occupied the center, were named Croker's Mountains, after the secretary to the Admiralty. So, so much for John Ross's cherished dream that Lancaster Sound was the keyhole to the Northwest Passage. Nope, turns out it's blocked by mountains. He's fulfilled his naval mandate. He turns around and he sails back to England. But something strange had happened, and I'm gonna pick up in the book here for a moment. Ross is second in command, can you still hear me? Yeah? Ross's second in command, one William Perry, had been following at a distance in the other ship, and he hadn't seen the mountains that Ross claimed blocked the way out of Lancaster Sound. When he got home, he made this fact known to John Barrow, as the backer of the trip and England's leading champion of the quest for the Northwest Passage, Barrow naturally preferred the idea of the mountains not existing to the idea of their existing. Trusting Perry's word, he concluded that his commander had been wrong. A cloud of mistrust and derision began to gather around Ross, even though by most measures he had accomplished the extraordinary. Chief among his accomplishments was navigating a British ship through the treacherous waters of the Eastern Arctic and returning it safely home. At the same time, he had verified William Baffin's previously disputed travel report, opened up Baffin Bay for the British whaling industry, documented the first known encounter between Westerners and the regional Inuit population, gathered important information about tides, ice, and magnetism, and brought back any number of biological and geological specimens. But 
In the furor over the Northwest Passage, none of that carried much weight. Ross's reputation was tarnished, and it was soon to tank. Less than a year after the 1818 expedition returned to Britain, Barrow sent William Perry back to Lancaster Sound for a second look. This time, Perry did see the Coker Range, and then he sailed right through it. The mountains were a mirage. John Ross had fallen victim to one of the stranger and more fascinating optical phenomenon on Earth. Anyone who has been in a car on a hot day is familiar with the mirage in which a pool of water seems to cover the highway in the distance, but disappears as you approach. This is called an inferior mirage, or sometimes a desert mirage, since the same phenomenon causes travelers in hot, dusty lands to think that they're seeing oases. But very few of us are familiar with mirages of the kind Ross saw, because the conditions necessary to produce them are usually found only near the Earth's poles. This type of mirage is known as a superior or arctic mirage. Inferior mirages show us things that don't exist, puddles on the road or pools in the desert. But superior mirages show us things that are real. The mountains that John, that John Ross saw did exist. The trouble is they weren't 25 miles west of him in Lancaster Sound. They were 200 miles west of him on a distant island in the Canadian Arctic. So I'm not going to read you guys the technical explanation for how superior mirages happen, although it's very tempting because I found it fascinating. I almost stopped writing this book halfway through and decided to just write about polar exploration. <laughs> it's frankly much more fun. <laughs> but I do want to just draw attention to a couple of facts about this particular story of wrongness because uh, I think it illustrates a few crucial points about our overall relationship to error. The first is that the experience of being wrong until you realize it, feels uncannily like the experience of being right. There's really nothing like looking at a mountain to make you think you're looking at a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody in that moment is going to stop and say, huh, I wonder if that's really a mountain. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to stand here and say, is this a microphone? <laughs> you know, when things seem that self-evident to us, we just take them for granted. We don't even stop to question our beliefs. That can be true of perceptual experiences like the one John Ross had, but it's certainly also true of a number of uh, other beliefs as well. We just never stop to wonder if they might be wrong. The second point that I want to make about John Ross's experience is that he wasn't a dumb guy. He wasn't inexperienced. He wasn't lazy. He wasn't trying to undermine the economy and well-being of the United Kingdom. He was, in fact, behaving totally sensibly, and his error didn't arise from some kind of intellectual or moral failing. It arose because he fell victim to a completely natural process that any of us in his place also would have experienced. And this is a really crucial insight about error to my mind. Most of the time, we don't get things wrong because we're being idiotic or unethical or in some other form, just subpar human beings. We get things wrong because we have these brilliant, brilliant minds that quite often produce really stellar results. And every once in a while, those same processes run up against really unusual circumstances and produce a less than stellar result. So that's the second point I want to make about this story. And the last point I want to make is that although this particular error served to uh, pose some problems to John Ross's career, it isn't intrinsically bad. And one really great way to see that is to look at the history of Arctic mirages and what they've done for us. In about 1000 AD, the Vikings landed in North America. This fact completely baffled historians for a really long time, partly because they had to sail a very long way to get to North America. And you got to wonder, what would possibly possess you to get into a boat that by today's standards is unimaginably rickety. I mean, you could like capsize these things in the Charles, right? <laughs> and they get in these boats and they sail across some of the most treacherous ocean in the entire world and they land in North America. What motivates them? How do they even have a sense that there's something worth looking for? Well, it turns out that those Vikings that got in those boats had for generations and generations been seeing intermittently Arctic mirages of Baffin Island from the shores of, uh, where were they? <laughs> Greenland, thank you. <laughs> it's really helpful to have knowledgeable people in your audience. 
So here's an instance where, far from being disastrous, this error literally brought these people to a new world. And I think the same can be said of a lot of our own mistakes, and it's partly why I champion them. And in that vein, I want to just, before I wrap up, read to you a passage from the end of the book. Um, it's not a story. It's also not very long, so bear with me. And uh, the main thing I will say about it by way of introduction is that um, I really hate the expression to err as human. <laughs> and I hate it because it's a cliche. You know, it's, it's the kind of thing that makes writers go crazy because it's, it's words whose content has long since been just scrubbed clean. You don't really think about that phrase when you hear it at all. And when you spend five years thinking about wrongness, you hear that phrase a lot and it gets really, really, really old. Nonetheless, there's a way that this entire book is essentially an investigation into that cliche and an effort to understand why that's the case. Why do we associate erring with being human and being human with erring? And what are the real and deep and substantive connections between those two experiences? It's a point of pride for me that while that phrase does appear in this book, and trust me that no one but me would ever notice this, it appears exactly once and that's three pages from the end. <laughs> By which point I figured it's now or never. And I'm going to read you the passage that it appears in. Uh, I've been in the middle of writing about the alternative attitude toward error, the one that is the kind of mirror image of the one I started out by describing in which being wrong makes us want to eat our shoes and our hats and get sick and die. In this alternative attitude, wrongness reminds us that the human mind is far more valuable and versatile than it would be if it just passively reflected the pre precise contours of reality. For those who share this view, the fact that our beliefs inhere in our minds, instead of you know just exactly reflecting the world around us, that fact is a given and a gift. One whose benefits, humor, imagination, intelligence, individuality, are so manifestly worthwhile that we willingly pay for them with our mistakes. What other entity can lay claim to wrongness after all? Not God, obviously, since the monotheistic versions, at least, are all-knowing and incapable of error. And as far as we know, not any animals other than ourselves either. If there's a sense in which a lion errs when it pounces too soon and misses its prey, or a sense in which an owl is somehow mistaken about its notion of the night sky, it is surely nothing like the sense in which we human beings are wrong. It seems safe to say that no lion has ever berated itself for making a mistake, or waxed defensive about it or turned it into a funny story to recount to the rest of the pride. Nor, presumably, is there any variation between one owl's idea of night and another's, nor any way for them, individually or collectively, to revise their understanding of the cosmos. These creatures can no more get things wrong than they can make up stories about cowardly lions, or about owls that deliver the mail at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. In both cases, the limitation is the same. They cannot imagine things that do not exist. We can, and so much the luckier for us. Machines, too, are incapable of error in the human sense. However much a computer or a Blackberry or an ATM might excel at revealing our mistakes, whether as designers or as users, neither they nor any of their electronic kin can make errors on their own. To begin with, error is contingent on belief. And while machines can arguably know things in the sense of possessing accurate information, they can't believe things in the way that you and I can. Granted, certain advanced forms of artificial intelligence have some capacity to generate theories about the world and revise those theories in the face of counter-evidence, a capacity that could be said to amount to a crude form of belief. Even the most cutting-edge machines generally don't do this very well, but that's not the point. The point is that they don't do it with emotion. And emotion is central to both the idea of belief and the idea of wrongness. Surprise, confusion, embarrassment, amusement, anguish, remorse, delight. Take away all of that, and whatever process of belief collapse and reconstruction that remains doesn't look anything like error as you and I experience it. In the face of information that violates their representations of the world, 
Machines do not go into denial or blame their programmer or turn red or laugh out loud. If they are sufficiently sophisticated, they update their representations. Otherwise, they freeze or they fail. These uh, last two options are nicely captured by the two stock devices used in science fiction when an android is confronted with input that contradicts its existing database. The first is the freeze response, does not compute. The second is the fail response, instant and violent self-destruction. As far as we know then, error is uniquely ours. To err is human, I'm only human, our fallibility is what keeps us suspended between the kingdom of lesser animals and the kingdom of God. The important truth behind these sayings isn't that we must be wrong from time to time. It's that we can be wrong. Alone among the creatures of the world, we can hatch crazy ideas, pursue pipe dreams, speculate wildly, keep faith with even the most far-fetched fantasies. Sometimes these notions flourish and bear fruit, and sometimes they collapse. But unlike androids, we humans do not normally self-destruct in the face of our mistakes. On the contrary, we self-create. I'm going to leave it there for the moment. Yeah, thank you for asking that. The question, again, for anyone who missed it was, um, it, uh, can I talk a little bit about the ways that being wrong is a prelude to learning and achievement? I think uh, it's a crucial question. It is, in some sense, the driving question, or at least the driving impulse behind my book, which is the belief that without error, we are really limited in our capacity to change, to learn, to grow up, to make discoveries. Uh, to some extent, the, the story of the Vikings is a good example of that. But certainly, this occurs all the time in our daily lives as well. There's um, an interesting body of research that I'm going to air because it's my sister's, and she sadly can't be here. And I feel like I should represent her some way. But uh, she's a cognitive scientist, she studies child development, and one of the things that she's found is that children, and we're talking very small children, you know, nine months to 36 months old, are vastly more motivated to explore their environment, meaning basically to learn, when their theories are violated. So if you confirm a kid's belief about the world, they're like, okay, boring, right? Move on to something else. But if you defy it, if you show them information they didn't expect, <laughs> that contradicts their existing database, <laughs> they're going to get out there and they're going to learn some things. And I think that uh, I in its kind of bare bones way is true for all of us, that wrongness is really a huge engine of how we learn about the world. You know, I, actually, these questions are probably related because one answer, it's certainly not the only answer, but one answer to why I was drawn to this book is that um, I am a stubborn, opinionated person who comes from a long line of stubborn, opinionated people. <laughs> I'm looking at them. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> as a result, I, I spend a lot of time asserting very confidently beliefs for which I have an extremely small amount of evidence, and then commencing to defend them with really unmerited ferocity. And, uh, you know, it, as I said, this isn't the whole story for why I started writing the book, but I do think that I started noticing in myself the desire to be right. You know, the, the, this book is about being wrong, but in many ways, the original thought process had a lot to do with being right, with why we're all so attached to that experience, with the consequences of being that attached to that experience. And uh, I observe this in myself, but I will say that it's also not a coincidence that I first started thinking about this idea in the fall of 2004, which, as you might recall, was a moment when everyone in our country seemed to feel they were very passionately right and that some other people were very passionately wrong. And there's a way that this book was also born out of that moment of very, very intense political divisiveness. There were some other factors as well, but that's a couple of them. To the other question, um, there's probably people in this room who could answer it better than I. Uh, that question was, did the experience of writing a book about being wrong change my own relationship to it? Uh, the, the short answer is um, yes, absolutely, and also not nearly as much as one might hope. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm still a stubborn, opinionated person. I'm still very quick to advance potentially unwarranted opinions about the world. And I actually believe in the importance of having convictions. This book is in no way an argument against having passionate beliefs about the world. What has changed for me is that I'm much more attentive to my own thought processes and how they manifest in my behavior, and I'm much more attentive to how I react 
in experiences where in, in instances where right and wrong are on the table. I think I've become a lot quicker to say, you know what, I have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, and <laughs> which is actually turns out to be a really socially helpful skill. The other thing that <laughs> the other and, and possibly more important thing is that I've become much more curious about people I disagree with. I think it's really easy when people disagree with you about your most fundamental beliefs to write them off in various ways, including in the relatively low-key way of just deciding not to spend any time on them or with them. And working on this book certainly stoked my interest and curiosity and in a sense, therefore, my empathy about people who think I'm wrong and I think they're wrong. I talk about this quite a lot in the book. Um, I didn't set out to write a book about moral wrong. <laughs> um, but it turns out that you can't really write about the other kind of wrong without spending at least a fair amount of time thinking about moral issues for a lot of reasons. Probably the most crucial reason is that some of our most life-altering and challenging experiences of being wrong concern coming to believe that we were wrong about a moral belief we used to hold. Um, but it's also the case that if you look at the history of how we think about wrongness, which is something I try to do in this book, it turns out that the idea of error and the idea of evil are related at every turn. I mean, it's not actually just a random ling linguistic coincidence that we use the word wrong to refer to both of these things. There's a huge body of thought that suggests that error you know, essentially is, is like evil or is a form of evil, that getting things wrong is a minor sin, it's a consequence of our fall from grace. So when you start looking into the history of wrongness uh, as, a, as a kind of, in the sort of mistake or the intellectual error sense, uh, you, you wind up delving very deeply into questions of moral wrongness. Um, the, I think, here's my, here's my kind of off the cuff instinct about that, as someone who's already identified herself as fearlessly advancing beliefs, which she only has semi half-baked ideas. Um, I think that you're probably right that emotion is crucial to the experience of learning, that when we have a really powerful emotional response to something, it sticks with us longer, we think about it harder, uh, it makes a larger impression on us than if we were gonna shrug these things off. And in fact, um, one of the things that Ross Gelbspan told me is that you know he's never forgotten this mistake, and that it's it served some very useful purposes in his life as a result, including keeping him from making similar assumptions in the future. Um, and I want to be clear that in no way am I trying in this book to make an argument against our emotional responses to error. I think that a lot of them are pretty inevitable, and I also think that a lot of them, as you suggest, probably are quite helpful. What I think is problematic is having an entire attitude toward error that shuffles us past that moment of emotion, the moment of humiliation, and into a, into a dismissal of wrongness as some sort of indictment of our overall worth. Because that's where I think the potential jolt of learning that we get out of the emotion of the experience is essentially underdone or undercut by feeling like this is this horrible thing, there's something wrong with me that this happened. Uh, and in fact, I find that far from causing us, it's possible that those emotions cause us to think more about specific errors, but I think they deter us from thinking about error in general or thinking about error as a category. So in a sense, it works against us thinking about wrongness in the abstract in ways that could help us really improve and change our relationship to it. But I think it's a great question. Thank you. And I can't speak to them with any degree of specificity because I made a very deliberate decision when I set out to write this book that the one thing I was not going to do was undertake a cross-cultural study of attitudes towards wrongness for the simple reason that it already felt like an unimaginably vast and daunting topic. <laughs> uh, in some ways I regret it, maybe I would have gotten to do a bunch of great world travel, but as a result I can't, you know, I, I can't in any sort of heavily researched back way speak to that, but I will say that it came up as an issue all the time. Uh, in my in the course of researching the book, and as a question all the time, and I think it's safe to say that there's no question that our attitudes towards wrongness vary relatively radically from culture to culture, and we don't have to go to Japan or Israel or Uzbekistan to figure that out. The United States is one of the wonderful things about it. It's composed of so many different kinds of subcultures, and I think even there we see really radically varying attitudes towards being wrong. And we certainly see it across professional cultures. I mean, the, 
the attitude toward error within the sciences versus in business versus in politics versus in the arts, I mean, they could hardly be more different. And I, you know, my, my speculation would be that that's certainly true across national boundaries as well. I think it's a huge problem and it was in essence the motivating problem of this book. Uh, and, and in some sense, the uh, kind of implicit and sometimes explicit idea behind it is our current attitude toward being wrong is not only wrong itself, you know, it doesn't really comport with the facts in certain ways, but it's actually dangerous. Uh, it's, it's corrosive to our private relationships. I can't imagine there's anyone here who hasn't found themselves in the middle of a completely ridiculous squabble about like the best way to avoid the Fenway Park traffic or whatever, right? And you just get so convinced that you're right that suddenly you're spending a perfectly good two hours in traffic fighting instead of, I don't know, listening to music or whatever else you'll be doing. And certainly, as you say, it's hugely corrosive on a global scale and in really dangerous ways. Uh, unmoderated certainty has, as you point out, gotten us into wars we shouldn't be in. It has created standoffs where there would potentially otherwise be possibilities for diplomacy. It's, um, I think, a you know, any military, economic, or political historian will tell you that some of the gravest pitfalls of history are created by leaders who are unwilling to acknowledge their fallibility and unwilling to entertain counter evidence to their beliefs. So yes, absolutely, I think it's hugely dangerous. To the first point, what can we do about it? I alternate between feeling radically pessimistic on this front and cautiously optimistic. The radical pessimism stems from the fact that if you have even a glancing familiarity with world history, it doesn't look very good. Uh, there's a quite famous military historian, Barbara Tuchman, very well respected, who wrote a book called The March of Folly, and she essentially traces the attitude I'm describing about wrongness, the inability to reckon with it, the reluctance to entertain challenges to our beliefs. She traces this back, you know, all the way to Troy. <laughs> Do I think we're likely to change it in the next, you know, 48 years? Uh, it doesn't look so good. Uh, and I also think that this attitude toward error is unfortunately bolstered by a lot of pretty basic psychological realities and that that kind of change happens on such a small and painstaking scale that it can be easy to start feeling pretty pessimistic about it. That said, I would not have been able to get through this book if I didn't believe that you can change how people think about being wrong. And I do believe that if you can change how people think about being wrong, you can start to change how they feel about it. And if you can start to change how they feel about it, you can start to change how they act. So in that sense, I think that, you know, I mean, maybe it's hopelessly naive and catch me at the end of my book tour and I'll be singing a different tune. But right now I kind of feel like, yeah, actually having wrongness as part of our cultural vocabulary, having some of these ideas, being able to talk about it and create a category for it. I think categories are powerful. I think they change how we think. And I would like to imagine that there's some change possible on this front. Um, so that's to your first question. The second question, um, I think you were asking for instances where I've found myself dealing more closely with people I disagree with. Yeah, or, or appreciating them and talking to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, it's interesting. One of the things that um, kind of got me thinking about wrongness in the first place was, as I mentioned, that I had the idea for this book in 2004. And one of the things that happened was that I got sent by the New York Times Magazine to go cover an event in Dallas, Texas. And the event was billing itself as the nation's first conservative film festival. Um, <laughs> right, and it gets a laugh because <laughs> Documentary film, like, it's kind of a lefty phenomenon for the most part, right? But here were these folks on the far right of the spectrum, and I mean really far right, right? It's not kind of centrist Republicans. This was the far, far right, and they had decided they were going to take over the genre of documentary film and throw themselves a festival. And I went down to cover it, and I was really excited about it because uh, this is the fun thing about being a journalist, right, is you get to kind of wander into other people's worlds and learn how they think. And it took me, like, 40 minutes to get unexcited. <laughs> largely because it was about that far into the keynote speech that opened the whole event when I realized that there was an enemy abroad in the nation and it was me <laughs> like I was I was the embodiment of everything evil and terrible in these people's eyes for any number of reasons and I walked away from that event feeling so profoundly alienated and 
it was one of the major factors that led me to write the book. And, and I, re- I think about it all the time. And I think about it because I wonder what I would do differently now if I were having those conversations. And it feels like a lost opportunity in many ways. I, um, as I said, I think that one of the things that became most clear to me in writing this book is that for the most part, people do not hold their beliefs because they're trying to destroy the world. <laughs> Even if you think their beliefs are actually conducive to the destruction of the world, that's not why they're holding them. They hold their beliefs sincerely. And I think trying to understand with sincerity other people's sincerely held beliefs is a lot of um, kind of what I gleaned from the experience of writing this. Putting it into practice is a different matter, partly because there's some beliefs that nobody wants to have challenged, right? I mean, there are, you're not gonna convince me that there's something profoundly wrong with my family of origin, with my family of choice. Like, there's just certain basic things we all believe that I, you know, no one's gonna budge you from that position. But I also think a reason it's really hard to confront that challenge is quite frankly, we don't spend very much time with people who disagree with us. You know, I don't know 75% of the people in this room, but I bet you you believe a lot of the things I believe. And that makes it quite tricky, actually, to start conversations about disagreement and wrongness with people we actually think are wrong and we disagree with them. Uh, And it's actually one of the things I'm thinking about in terms of what I'm interested in doing next as far as having more conversations like that. I don't know how satisfactory of an answer that was, but... Totally fascinating. Um, So for those who couldn't hear, the question was, do I know anything about type 3 errors? The short answer was no. It turns out a type 3 error is being right for the wrong reasons. Um, It's funny, I'm I'm going slightly batty in the back of my mind while I stand up here looking sane because there's an example that's like niggling on the edges of my imagination and I can't think of it. But what I would say off the top of my head about that is that it must be profoundly problematic. (laughs) Because I think the experience of being right is so reinforcing that I, my, my hunch would be that once we arrive at a correct outcome, we're incredibly resistant to or unable to reject the reasoning that led us there. I would love to hear your thoughts about it. I'm sure you're much more informed than I am. I, um, you know, I know a little bit about decision theory and certainly in the math and chess instances, uh, I've, I've read a little bit about this, but I've not heard about that kind of thing. But I think that, you know, we certainly, we can be wrong for the right reasons and we can be right for the wrong reasons. And uh, both, I think, call on us to do the same thing that's crucial in all of our relationships to wrongness, which is to actually think about how we think, <laughs> you know, to understand the process by which we arrive at something instead of just the outcome. And that doesn't come naturally to most people, I would, which is why I would guess that, as you say, those kinds of errors are particularly hard to correct for. I think that's true. We, um, as a whole, are not terribly comfortable with the experience of uncertainty. Uh, And in a way, this book is as much about our relationship to certainty and doubt as it is about our relationship to rightness and wrongness. We don't like to sit in that space of no answer. (laughs) Uh, And certainly there's many situations in which we would prefer an instantaneous wrong answer to waiting around for the right answer. And you see that, unfortunately, all the time in politics and in in business as well. I'm going to assume that good at that by good at being wrong, you mean good at handling it, right? Not just good at, okay. Because there's lots of people who are very good at being wrong. (laughs) Um, You know, there actually is some interesting research about people who are good at being wrong. There's not, to my knowledge, a whole bunch of it. But there's this interesting political scientist named Philip Tetlock who did a series of longitudinal studies, really longitudinal, like 15, 20, 25 years. And he looked at political forecasters, so pundits, academics, anybody who was in the business of making predictions about what was going to happen in the political sphere. And he compared their predictions to the actual outcomes. And we're talking about things like people arguing in the 60s, you know, about whether the, you know, the fate of the Iron Curtain or the fate of the Berlin Wall. So, you know, very long-term studies. And he compared, as I said, the predictions to the outcomes. And then he went back and he talked to the people who'd made these original forecasts and tried to get a sense of how they reconciled, especially in those cases where they'd been wrong, how they reconciled their erroneous forecast with what had actually happened. Well, it turns out that what he'd actually expected to find was that it cleaved to political persuasion, essentially. He expected to find that people who were generally aligned with Democrats were going to be better at coping with their mistakes and people who were generally aligned with Republicans were going to be worse at it. And he didn't think this just because he was some knee-jerk liberal. There had actually been some evidence prior to his study suggesting that this was the case. But Philip Tetlock found something different. He found that the deciding factor has nothing at all to do with your actual political affiliation. 
it had to do with a complex constellation of factors that is probably best summed up as metacognition, which is what I was just talking about. It has to do with your capacity to think about how you think. The more able people were to analyze their own decision-making process, the more able they were to accept the fact that they'd been wrong and alter their opinions in the face of counter evidence and move forward. So I guess I should probably wrap it up at that. I just want to thank, first of all, all of you guys again. This has been totally fabulous. And also the Harvard Bookstore for having me. Thank you.